Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Spencertown Academy Art Center's Festival of Books, author presentations. Thank you for being here with us on this beautiful day. As many of you know, this event is usually held outdoors in a big tent that holds over 100 people. The festival is a major fundraiser for our nonprofit, almost entirely volunteer organization. So we're happy to be here on Zoom for our 15th annual festival and to be able to carry on this tradition of presenting great authors and artists talking about their work. Before I introduce today's guests to discuss their film, I want to remind you that there are several events going on this weekend and more through this week and into next weekend. And our great special books online sale continues into early October. Check it all out on our website, spencertownacademy.org for information and more details. Also, since this is a virtual session, we all know that technical issues may arise. So we ask for your patience while we sort things out, if that should happen. Now on to the main event. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us a group of filmmakers, producers of the wonderful documentary, The Booksellers. How could we not have this feature here at this event, peopled as it is each year by thousands of book lovers and many collectors and dealers as well. If you've not had a chance to watch this movie yet, I strongly recommend it. Um, you can go online to booksellersmovie.com to find the streaming source best for you. That's uh, book, booksellersmovie.com. Uh, we'll look at a short, um, some, a couple of short clips later today. Let me introduce our illustrious panelists. The director of the booksellers is D.W. Young, whose works have been shown at many major film venues, including South by Southwest, the New York Film Festival, DOC NYC, and the Vancouver International Film Festival. Two of his feature films, A Hole in a Fence and The Happy House, were released by First Run Features. Welcome, D.W. Thank you for having us. Judith Mizrahi and Dan Wexler are producers on the film. Judith's award-winning documentaries, features, and shorts have screened at festivals, including South by Southwest, Doc NYC, and New York Film Festival. Previously, she led the marketing and outreach teams at Women Make Movies and First Run Features. Welcome, Judith. Hi. Thanks for having us. Dan is a native New Yorker, himself a rare bookseller, as well as a publisher and filmmaker. His documentary, More Than the Rainbow, premiered at Doc NYC in 2012 and won the award for Best Documentary Film at the Coney Island Film Festival. Dan co-authored with George Koppelman, Shakespeare's Beehive, an account of an extraordinary annotated dictionary Welcome, Dan. Hello. Parker Posey is the executive producer on the film, but unfortunately she's unable to be with us today. Her work on the Netflix series Lost in Space is gearing up as we speak. Parker's memoir entitled You're on an Airplane, a self-mythologizing memoir, was a national bestseller and just is just now out in paperback. If you have questions for our panelists, please send them in at any time during the discussion. Just click on the Q&A link on the info bar at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to them in our Q&A portion a little bit later. A huge welcome to you all. My Thank first you. question, um, probably for Dan, is probably one that you have answered, been asked and answered many, many times, and that's, however did you come to make a movie on this topic? What was the germ of this idea? Well, I, I don't mind answering it again because it, um, it's tied into how I became a, a bookseller. Um, when you're, you graduate college as an English major and you don't go right to graduate school, you ask yourself, well, what do I do? And um, I soon found myself working in a secondhand bookshop in Washington, D.C., Second Story Books. And I was just fascinated by the, the passion of the, of the people who came into the shop, those who worked at the shop, uh, the owner of the shop, Alan Stipek. It was this incredible world to me uh, almost immediately. Um, now I've been in it for 
for about 30 years, but almost instantly I thought someone should do a movie about this, this world. And um, the, as you fast forward and I became a little bit involved in film and I met David and Judith and we worked on some projects together. And it occurred to us that, that there really hadn't been any film that looked at the book world. So although the one that we ended up putting together was focused on the New York rare book world, we thought, you know, if this can be a springboard to a discussion on books and culture, um, that could be a really wonderful thing, not just for people interested in what's going on in New York, but everywhere. And I think it's been satisfying to see the film now start to appear in different parts of the world where there also wasn't a film like this. And so in that, in that, to that extent, you know, it's, it's, that was the vision was to, to kind of show this world and make it as diverse as, as we could, not just focus on one character, but that original idea was from working in this shop and just seeing this everyday, you know, fascination with the book. And to the point that, I mean, the characters to me right away were, were just these inspiring group of people. Um, and I thought, Let's have some of these voices tell this story. And and uh, DW, I'm curious about the process of the film, uh, pro process of making of the film, um, how it evolved. Did you have an idea of how you would approach it? Um, did you have a pre-planned storyline, a story arc, or did it somehow just grow organically? We never had like a, a, a really distinct story arc in mind, and and I think. What we were committed to from the beginning is what Dan mentioned was that it would not be a single dealer we were following that we would, you know, really make it more comprehensive to the degree we could reasonably. And um, so I think that sort of from the beginning meant that it wasn't going to be like a narrative arc in a, like in that way. So I think it was more that I had we had certain intuitions, certain things we wanted to focus on um, and a feeling for things that, you know, needed to be in there and then was a lot of it was then a process of discovery as well as we as we filmed and we added you know more people they led to other people as i became as i learned a lot as i went along you know i was learning more and i was doing my own research and talking to people that introduced certain you know aspects to me that maybe i wanted you know we talked about and brought in some other things and dan of course from having the inside uh, insider's sort of perspective i think kept us on honest in a lot of ways but also introduced a lot of things and people that might have been harder to come by otherwise um and then I think, you know, as we went, things like starting and ending at the book fair was something I had an idea for at a certain point, sort mm -hmm. of a bookend component. Yes. Mm -hmm. Although then we added another even further bookend with the readings at the beginning and the end. Um, and then, you know, it was always understood in my mind that a lot of this would be constructed in the edit. Um, but, you know, so it's a bit, it's sort of like half and half. You know, you mm -hmm. start to outline things as you go and you start to develop an idea for how it could work. But it's, I think for something like this, it has to be fairly organic too. I find the scope of the film amazing. You go into areas of the book world that I never could have imagined. Did you find that you had to stop yourself from going off on a tangent or down a rabbit hole, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I think, the, 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 of course, the wonderful thing about the rare book trade and that I think made us very enthusiastic of making the film, too, was that it encompasses so much. It encompasses almost anything you can think of in terms of as far as books are concerned and not just books. So it's sort of limitless. And if you ever go in like, rare book Instagram, I mean, you can literally go on forever just looking at an unending stream of incredible book, you know, f glamour photos, basically. Um, so I think this idea that you could never cram enough in satisfactorily was something we sort of had to contend with. But I also think that gave us comments that we could make a feature length film out of this. But I think it w there was an absolute feeling that at some point you had to step away, you had to draw a line. Um, so you know, I would like, I, I mean, we have material, we could have kept cramming a lot more and probably there's a small, much smaller audience for whom that would have been interesting. But then I think we would have lost the ability to, you know, um, I think make it accessible to a somewhat broader audience, which was something we wanted to do, obviously not to everybody necessarily, but we didn't want to make it so esoteric and specific that, you know, only rare book fiends, you know, would, would find the movie sort of interesting. When did you start filming and how long did it take? Um, about three years ago, did we start? Yeah. Three and a half years so, ago. 2017 um, and a half? 
Yes, that sounds right. <laughs> um, and it, you know, it was a process. We we uh, it was a year ago that we we finished uh, the film completely and uh, and premiered New York Film Festival. Um, so it's it, and then distribution and everything. So it's 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 all kind of a, a long process. But the, but it was yeah three and a half years ago. And what's the the balance of uh, the the time spent filming and the time spent editing? I'm always curious about that. Especially when you have so much material like you must have had. That's a good question. Um, you know, I think we did shoot here and there a bit as we were editing. Um, a couple of additional interviews, you know, extra visual material, mm -hmm. a few little things. And so, you know, with something like this, I think that's helpful to have the ability to continue crafting a little bit as you're editing and keep shooting, which, you know, with like a big budget narrative film or a narrative, and often it's not possible. You kind of, what you shoot is what you get and you may not be able to shoot pickup stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I think maybe two thirds shooting, one thirds editing would be very roughly. Interesting. Where we landed. Interesting. And and you were shooting in largely in New York City, but in many other locations as well. But I have a question about filming in New York City. Did you encounter any specific difficulties, particular to filming in New York City? Yeah, traffic. <laughs> Traffic. The horror show noise. of New York traffic and well noise too, but traffic was just oh. a never ending burden because we, Peter Bolte, who shot the film um, and I did most of the, inter you know, Dan or Judith would come occasionally um, when they could and, but you know, we were the main sort of production crew for day in, day out and we were both coming from Brooklyn, you know, a lot of times we we're coming uptown in the city or at least midtown or, and just endlessly battling New York traffic, I think was truly our, our one biggest hurdle. Oh. And paying for parking, right? And paying and the cost of, or trying not to pay for parking by finding a spot if we could and exactly. or running out to a meter once in the middle, you know. And there's uh -huh. also the, you know, you set up the, an interview and then like jackhammering starts outside and oh. then, you can't tell yes. you how many times that happened and I got like <laughs> very sound effects. phone calls, yeah. I, well, sound I think the worst jackhammer happened on the quietest residential street <laughs> in Brooklyn that you would never have expected to have noise problems. So uh. You never know. <laughs> Well, you did a good job hiding it. Um, the booksellers featured in the film are fascinating characters. You just wanted to know more about them. They were just charming and funny and full of ideas. Um, this short clip, Monk, we're ready for this. Uh, in, this short clip introduces just a few of the dealers shown here at the New York Antiquarian Book Fair. Uh, uh, held every year at the uh, Park Avenue Armory. Let's take a look. My name is Henry Wessels. I work with uh, James Cummins Books in New York, and it's another New York book fair, which is the roller coaster ride between tedium and great bits of commerce and discoveries. My PhD is in 16th century Spanish lyric poetry which explains why I'm totally broke. And, you know, after 15 years of academia, I left that in order to become an antiquarian book dealer. So I have had the pleasure of having really fantastic books in my hands. We have a third folio, which was J.P. Morgan's copy, which he bought in 1897. And at the same time, he bought a first edition of the first book ever printed, the Gutenberg Bible, for 2750 pounds on vellum. It's probably now a $40 million. Well, we just got in like a few days before the fair, which is always exciting, um, is a Hemingway archive. And there was a Castro doll in the archive, which we were a little surprised to find. It's been a pretty good show. I mean, it's, you know, a little less to carry home. As you can see, I deal in really big books, so I really like it when some of them go away. Lift it up and put it back where it was. Oh, about how you found these folks. Well, I think um, Dan really launched us in that regard. He, I think we started out with a, a number of dealers that he recommended from his own, you know, 
acquaintance and friends, friends, acquaintances, people or people he maybe didn't know that well, but had a sense of how they could fit into the movie well. And so that was, I think, our first initial phase. And then we added more as we went. I sort of added some people like, for various reasons. We added like uh, Fran and then later Susan Orlean. And so, but Dan, you were going to say. Well, I say we had, I had a list in my head of the must haves. Like it, oh. I would, people I would be begging, even if they said no at first. And then there were some that were, okay, if we can fit them in. Um, and then probably the most um, uncomfortable group now are all the booksellers that I know who ask me all the time, why wasn't I in the movie? So I get that a lot. <laughs> Some of them might even be waiting to ask the question. Because I've had uh -huh. people standing up. and saying, You're hiding. Yeah. <laughs> I must admit that I was a little frustrated at times that you chose not to identify the speakers in the film, aside from a handful. And of course, we need no introduction to Fran Leibowitz. What was the thinking behind this? Well, you know, that's a fairly conventional thing to do, but I, um, and I, I'm not opposed to doing it in, in many cases or most cases necessarily, but um, in this case, I think, you know, we wanted to make the film immer as immersive as possible for your relationship to the people on screen to be a little different, not just to see them as sort of talking heads and to make it more about them as characters and to make it more conversational and, and to make it more of an experience of the book world as opposed to information about the book world. Not that we didn't also want to convey relevant and useful information about the rare book world, but I think that was um, the main motivating factor. And you know, when you, as soon as you see identifiers on screen, and we would have had to have a, had a lot constantly flowing by, um, it really changes your relationship to what you're viewing and your sense of being in that. And in this case, I, it was some and a desire to you know we lost a little on one side, I think, but we gained hopefully something in the, in the other respect. And I I think if you know having looked at cuts where I put the identifiers in it didn't feel right to me in the sense that I, we were losing something. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a trade off. I worked very hard though, I will say in the edit to provide as much other means of reading the film and noticing who the people are. So yes. there are visual indicators of their names in, in, in images and other things. And of course the main people we highlight, we get their first name, um, which again, it, you know, it makes it more informal, it makes it different when you just know someone's first name. But then you know if you're watching, you can pick up on a lot more. And, you know, if you go to a book fair, for example, you're not going to know whoever you're talking to who's a dealer exactly who they are. They're just the dealer with this, who deal, you can see their books, but you don't necessarily know that their full name or whatever. So um, I think it was pursuing things along those lines. So it wasn't just an aesthetic choice. Well, it's partly um, aesthetic, but I think it's, mm -hmm. it's a few things at once. Mm -hmm. And we did get to have a little treasure hunt for clues. Right. Or as to their well, and I, very much like, I think that's such a part of the rare book world and, and how books are valued is that a lot of, you know, what makes a book valuable are things that you can discover that have been discovered about that book or that have been, you know, um, added to the book if it's in terms of an attribution or, uh, you know, if it's signed or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea that there's a little bit of, you know, the movie hopefully in various ways rewards you for looking closely, mm -hmm. uh, just like the rare book world itself does. Mm -hmm. Is there as much camaraderie in the business as it seems in the film, or is it a cutthroat business in any sense? Everybody seemed to be very friendly. I'm going to pass this to Dan. I'll just say <laughs> sure. one thing. Uh, I, I, it's, I, we cho I, obviously, it's a business, so obviously there's much cutthroat. There are many cutthroat aspects. It's obviously that's there. I, we consciously chose, it just felt like it would get petty. And it would be very hard to get people to, to on screen want to engage in that way. And we really trying to have a positive line on it. So we chose really to just emphasize the positive. I think it's extremely collegial, but Dan uh, could probably speak more on that. Yeah, I, I think there, I mean, there are plenty of people who can't stand each other in the business, like any <laughs> business. And, but once you, if you try to introduce a narrative like that, um, you know, then people are really gonna want you to follow that. And books themselves are perhaps the most important character in the movie. And so to distract yourself with so-and-so doesn't like, I did have a few people ask me, is this person going to be in it? Is that person? Um, but to get to your first question, which is the camaraderie in the business, um, I think that's what has a lot of us staying in it for as long as we have is because it is really, I mean, you're tied together by your love of the book. And, um, but it goes beyond that. You find yourself in different parts of the world. In one vision of this, I saw, well, we could, show that there are all these book fairs in different, I mean, there's a book fair in Abu Dhabi. I did the first antiquarian book fair in Hong Kong. So all over the world, these events take place 
And um, one of the great things to do after a fair is to go out and eat. And their booksellers tend to be foodies. And this is a, it's not a wonderful time for that many things right now, but food is one of those things that wherever you go, it's that's sort of like a real high point, I think, <laughs> historically. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the camaraderie comes out after the fair. You, you talk about the customers, the books, and you get together. And at one point, we had more of that dinner scene that closes uh, uh -huh. the film. Uh -huh. And that was, it didn't quite work as a narrative device throughout. But um, I, I think, you know, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to show booksellers getting together, just shooting the breeze, because that's what they do quite often. It was a great scene. At one point, Fran Leibowitz makes the point that what we used to refer to as bookstores, we now call independent bookstores. The large chains like Barnes and Noble certainly have a huge influence on book sales and on what we see on their shelves and where they are, where the books are. Nancy Bass Wyden of Strand, of the Strand Bookstore, tells us that in the 1950s, there were 368 bookstores in New York City. Now she counts only 79. And yet book sale numbers are looking positive, all things considered. And yet also the independents seem to be springing up and often thriving. What are their chances, do you think? Maybe this year the pandemic, pandemic is a bad time to make any predictions, but what's your feeling, um, Dan, Judith? I am, um, I'll just say, uh... I think if anything, like what this pandemic has, has kind of shown us is that, I mean, yes, anyone can buy books online and people obviously frequently do, but I think everyone being so isolated, um, and, and by the way, it's great that people are buying books online <laughs> during this and keeping the book bookstores afloat, but I think people are really realizing that the communal spaces we have, bookstores, um, you know, even our house theaters, they're so es essential to a culture. And I think, um, you know, I think it's just not going to be like everything is going to go online. I think people really want those actual spaces where they can walk in, where they can talk to humans, where they can browse things physically and not get computer generated recommendations. And um, I feel very optimistic about bookstores. <laughs> so fewer, but still there, basically. Yeah, kind of a different model. You know, you may not have this big sprawling city model aside from the Strand, you still have Argosy, which we featured in the film. But I think for the future, uh, a shop like Eric and Jess have a, they appear in the film also mm -hmm. with, for Left Bank Books. That's the kind of um, shop I think in Eric's words are engages with, with the neighborhood um, and, and can really fit in, you know, and they, they seem to have, have done uh, a terrific job. And if you speak to people, who go into left bank and they just love it. You know, it's on this beautiful little block in New York. They don't have a lot of square footage, but it's the type of bookstore I think you could see more and more of. And there are, there are other bookshops like that in Brooklyn and in different places now. That, that's a newer kind of model. Right, uh, so many of them are not the bookstores of old, but maybe more focused on a theme or style or a cultural niche. Could you share some of these interesting or quirky niche areas that you came across? Well, I think it's I think it's important to maybe differentiate between the small these smaller, more curated stores um, that are dealing in new or perhaps new and used, and ones that are really sort of focused on rare. And okay. there are very I think very few brick and mortar rare bookstores, comparatively speaking. I think that is seems to be a much harder thing to pull off um, and you know of the two that we show in the film that are new that were new and left bank is as Dan mentioned has, has really done a great job and been able to keep going and um, but uh, Lizzie Young's cookbook culinary focused rare book and store um, you know she had to close that up and I'm, I'm hoping she'll open something else but so it's not so easy I think I think with the, on the newer side I think as Judith pointed out the there is a real I think amongst the younger generations too a real uh, sense of this reckon, reckon, recognition of the importance of in-person, you know, physical browsing and and sort of the communal aspect a lot of these stores have, and just the sense of then I think the, that is an escape almost, you know, a reprieve from the purely digital. I think it has merit for them that way. Um, so I think I think there's a lot of potential there, and I think that on that in that respect. There's a lot of room for optimism. Um. Glad to hear that. 
Fran Lebowitz has a large presence in your film, and she has something to say about the future of books. This short clip includes a small portion of her contribution. Let's take a look. You know, I think the death of the book is highly overrated. I go on the subway a lot, and the people that I see reading books, actual books on the subway, are mostly in their 20s. This is one of the few encouraging things you will ever see in a subway. And I told this to my editor, and he said that the people who read mostly on the Kindle are mostly in their 40s. Yeah, I don't know why millennials are getting so much slack for, like, killing bookstores. We're carrying it. We're reading. We're buying. As much as this idea that books are dying or they're somehow crumbling, which is, of course, not true, try to open a file from your computer seven years ago. It's a hit or miss proposition. You can, of course, open any book from 500 years ago and think about and read what's there. Books survive in incredible numbers. People don't like destroying them. They don't burn very well. People don't like throwing them away. Even illiterate people won't throw books away because they have this sort of sense of magic in them. I personally have never been able to throw a book away. I have seen books, like in trash, and it, to me, it's like seeing like a human head in the trash, even if it's a horrible book. How did Fran Leibowitz become involved? Is she a serious collector? Um, so we, when we were, you know, in the planning phases of the film, we, uh, I think there was an, an article at some point where Fran was talking about moving apartments in New York and about, you know, how she has like gazillions of books and what an ordeal it was. And it was very funny. Um, and she's, you know, uh, known as being quite a reader um, and a supporter of a physical book culture um, and is obviously like a classic New Yorker. So she seemed like a great uh, choice for us for an interview. She wasn't, uh, she's not a collector and she doesn't, she even has spoken about how she doesn't really, you know, she doesn't really care about if it's annotated or if it's, you know, the value of it. She just loves to read and she loves books and she loves having books. So, um, and that was fine for us because we, you know, we thought, you know, maybe she would speak about that. And if not, we just really did want someone speaking more generally about New York and book culture. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we reached out. She doesn't uh, have an email address or a computer or use email or anything. So, but luckily she oh. has, has an assistant who does and we reached out and she and agreed. And obviously we're super happy she is in the film. Mm -hmm. She's, um, I think you could describe her as like a voracious acquirer of books oh. as opposed to a collector. So I think she buys books anywhere and everywhere she can um, and I think going to bookstores is like a major activity in her life and um, she has been such a champion of bookstores um, and you can spot her in New York and I think you know she laments the loss I know of bookstores in New York you know very much um, but also you know she I think it's worth noting I think Judith first threw Fran out as as a, you know in a potential interview um, and for a second you know initially knowing that realizing she wasn't like really someone who was involved in rare books per se, you know, it took a little consideration for a second, but then the truth is, and we realized too, I think, is that Fran keeps you honest. She's not someone to mince words. She, you know, is incredibly, I think, um, critical in the very best possible sense about things. So, you know, I think that was great in that respect, I think bringing her into the film as a somewhat outside the rare book world perspective, um, you know, has a lot of value. And in the same way that, that Nicole Lowry kind of, will help carry the film, Fran does that, you know, and there's, they're both such great observers of, of the human, you know, the interaction that takes place. And so just being around books as often as, as, as they are, um, they, they just, they, they kind of kept it flowing, you know, throughout, while well, then you had the, the rare booksellers and collectors and occasional librarian doing, doing their thing, but they, they helped, you know, keep, keep the film sort of balanced from an from a outside viewer's standpoint. You also did show a couple of fabulous private libraries, private collections. Did you see many of these? Um, I, what we saw is pretty much all in the film. Um, and I think we felt, you know, we were pretty specific about why we were choosing the ones we were choosing. And of course we built on that from where we started, I think. Caroline Schimmels was probably the first private, I think she was the first significant private collector we spoke to. Um, 
But, uh, you know, what you see is pretty much those are the ones we went to. And Caroline Schimmel was the collector, collecting all, uh, uh, all or as much as uh, American women writers as she could uh, collect. And it's a, it's a wonderful um, presentation in the film of, of her um, passion and desire for what she's doing or desire for, for the results of what she's doing and presenting women authors. And she mentioned that she went to a collector once and said, where is your women's section? He said, oh, we don't have any. And she comes back with a load, armload of books. She says, oh, yes, you do. Yeah. So I think that was an, uh, an amazing part. Were there any other um, uh, amazing collections that you um, visited that you could talk about? I'll, sure. I'll talk about uh, Jay Walker's library. Um, was really, really fun. Uh, it was a really fun shoot. He um, has, I guess it's the largest private collection in the country or one of them, but um, it's called the History of the Library of the History of the Human Imagination. Um, and what was really incredible about that is, uh, the, well, the space is really interesting. You can see it in the film, it's designed, it's inspired by M.C. Escher and there's glass floors and uh, it's really interesting. Um, and I also loved, and there's just, it's, there's more than just books. Like he has a Sputnik, he has the, he has the crystal ball from the Wizard of Oz. And so he has a lot of, you know, dinosaur eggs. He has all sorts of fun things. But um, what I loved is the way that it's organized. So he, you know, the, they're not organized by subject, they're organized by height. Um, <laughs> uh, so his whole thing, and then the reason for that is, is this kind of beautiful sense of discovery. Like you could walk through this, place and, and find something that you weren't looking for um, because of the way they're organized on the shelf. So that was one that was that was really fun and, and hard to leave. I was just, I felt like a kid. I just wanted to run around all day long and, and touch everything. Did somebody, yeah. when, 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 when he walks into the New York Book Fair, booksellers smile. I mean, when you see him coming <laughs> toward your booth, let's put it that way. Um, and there are others too. I mean, I think once again, like David was saying in the beginning, um, you know, you could keep going down this, showing more and more, but we wanted to, to represent this balance throughout the whole, to the extent that we could in a film that's only an, an hour and 40 minutes long, which is to, to show as much of the diversity as the trade as we could, to show collectors, um, to get into the library uh, aspect of this business a bit. Um, because really, I mean, I've seen so many extraordinary libraries. It was nice that uh, in one of the, the images it's become a, a picture that, so many people have seen. I was one of Adam Weinberger in the library with the enormously tall shelves. So not everyone has ceilings that high. I mean, like usually, you know, you live in Europe or to get that kind of, um, so people see that image and they're like, where's, I, I need to get that apartment. But Adam was very generous in inviting us to a couple of the actual book buying experiences, which he didn't know how they would go. So in other words, those were, those were interesting because nothing is staged there the bookseller comes in interacts with the person who's who's interested in selling uh, the books something that booksellers do over and over again and thanks to adam we had several opportunities and we got to see in the film different apartments very different apartments where he he was looking at books that was a fascinating section of the a uh, couple of those apartments that he went into and the number of books and uh, the um state of the places was quite interesting. Yeah, he I talks about how you piece together a story, what the person did, all these exactly. different aspects, which is something, again, when you get into the trade, you don't realize you're gonna be getting into it, these windows into these people's lives, because mm -hmm. it's, it's a personal thing to find yourself in somebody's living room, in their bedroom. You generally go from room to room in the house. Hey, well, we also have books in the kitchen. We have books in the basement. And sometimes there are secrets that people forgot about that are there. So. It's a very intimate aspect of, of what a bookseller does is going to, to people's libraries and looking through their, their books. It's not a collection, but the place I would very much like to go back to would be Jim Cummins Warehouse. Oh. A very unassuming, uh, you know, office park in New Jersey that is full of 300,000 plus, you know, books you could, plus other things. So you could spend right. who knows how long just digging into that place. Your movie is visually beautiful. Aunt's Love sold out worldwide, that book. What's that? You, I'm sorry, I think there was an interference there. The, your movie is visually beautiful. I love what one of your speakers says about the book 
as a physical object, beautiful to look at, a work of art. Were there any issues you encountered in filming, maybe handling the rare books shown in the film? Um, I guess that's a question for DW or well, whoever. <laughs> generally, not really. Um, we didn't, for the most part, you know, film anything hands-on that was extraordinarily expensive. Um, a lot of stuff we got that we, when you see, you know, isolated uh, book examples, Dan, having Dan, you know, on board, you know, was a huge boon because we could take, you know, a fair amount of stuff from his available stock. And so that was a really a great benefit. I mean, I think we would have in the end been able to convince the other dealers, of course, to let us shoot stuff, but it would have been a lot more work, a lot more headache, et cetera, and working with their schedules and everything. So um, that was great. I, you know, I think, um, <laughs> I think the most nervous anyone was when was filming a, a private collector is that great Gatsby that you see, which is, um, you know, very, uh, very valuable. And, and the dust jacket, of course, is the most valuable part. And I think he was a little nervous about us playing a camera atop that and even just opening and handling it. But I let him hand, do all the handling in that regard. So we played it extra safe. But I will say that uh, I think a lot of people who come to the rare book world for the first time um, are surprised by, and I certainly was, was actually how, how much you can kind of handle and touch um, people. Uh, you know, when you go to the New York Book Fair or even the first time I went to, to Dan's office, you know, there's just these most incredible books. They're, they're really, really old and you just think you, ha you can't even get near them, you know, but um, booksellers love to just kind of hand you stuff and say, oh, you can hold it. And it's really wonderful and it, it feels great to hold. And, and you realize that they, you know, that they have been around a long time and, and you know, and they were meant to be held by human hands. So I have a question for Dan in that regard. Um, Dan, do you, so when you, when you are like at a fair or you have, you know, people coming to look at the books, do you assess people kind of as to whether or not you feel okay about them handling it? Is there like a set of criteria? You yeah, well, keep? even within the trade, there are people who, who handle books beautifully and others, you just, you cringe when, um, um, I'll just, well, two examples from the film. I mean, and they're both very good friends of mine. I often have to like scream at Dave Bergman because he, he handles it with such gusto. I'm, I'm, I'm really worried. And Davis handled millions of books. I mean, literally, he's, uh, but he's just, a, whereas Jim Cummins, who kind of comes across as sort of rough, burly guy, his hand, it's like a surgeon's hand. Watching him, that was one of the first things after meeting Jim. I used to love to watch how he would go from being in this kind of rough mood to picking up this object and just so tenderly turning the pages. Um, most people assume that you're going to have to handle rare books with gloves. And when you've seen them in movies or whatnot, um, it's usually for show because it's easier. The tactile aspects of turning a page with a hand is safer, really, than having something in the way that kind of you lose the sensation. That You're more likely to, to tear a page doing it that way. Um, but yeah, so even among uh, people I know, <laughs> I, I, I can separate them into different categories. And I've seen people come into to booze at book fairs that really don't know what they're doing. And you sometimes have to take the book away from them. That has happened. Oh. My goodness. Um, I guess this question is for Judith and, and Dan both. How does a filmmaker get his or her work out into the world? What are some of the challenges facing the business today, COVID-19 notwithstanding? Um, I guess I'll go, I'll go first. Um, it, well, in general, it's it's in, in the best of times. It's hard to get films out there because there's so much. There's just so much all the time uh, calling for people's attention. But um, in our case, we were very lucky to have a, a wonderful world premiere at the New York Film Festival, which is really kind of the ideal place to launch our film. We thought um, the audiences were so excited, and uh, it really created that a uh, great launching place and great kind of buzz around the film then um and then we we work we're working with a great u.s distributor in uh, greenwich entertainment who really they they're i think excellent at kind of understanding kind of the importance of kind of grassroots outreach and and really reaching your your targeted audience audiences um so and then you know COVID was tricky because we, our film played uh, in theaters in New York for one week before they all closed down. So we, um, so it was, it was hugely disappointing. Um, but uh, 
we ended up going to pivoting to virtual cinema, which was which was ended up being actually surprisingly great, and we we could reach people um, that way as well. Um, so yeah, I think I think grassroots outreach is is one of the ways you really want to get your film out there. And we were lucky enough to have wonderful supporters of the film. Uh, the Strand was great uh, at helping us get the word out. Um, ABAA. Um, and, and some organizations who are just really enthusiastic about the film kind of help spread the word, so. Dan, anything to add to that? No, I think that was a pretty much a summation of what, of what you go for, uh, people who don't, the, the film festival is often uh, still grasp the launching pad for, for something like this. And uh, uh, the New York Film Festival was great for us. And but, is that very selective? Uh, I mean, is it, oh, great, I, we got into the festival or? Yeah. Of an open. Okay. We'll probably never get in again, but we, you know, <laughs> one, even getting in yeah. once is generally a. Don't say that. <laughs> Don't say that. Uh, yeah. Well, how long did it take Scorsese? Like, yeah. Right? Um, you know, I think, I, but I do. I would add that, like, even if you've made films before, even if you, for people who are, you know, very celebrated filmmakers, etc., every film, every next film is always a challenge to get the money, to get it out the way you want, to take have control, whatever it is, like. It's never not a challenge. I mean, the challenges may be somewhat at a different level, or, but I mean, I think the reality of making films is each time you're rediscovering a new way of, of doing everything slightly because the, you can't, there's no exact model for how you, you're going to do it. Each film is its own beast, kind of. Um, I just want to uh, post a reminder to the listeners, um, our audience, that if you have any questions for our panelists, please send them in and we'll get to them shortly. So here are a few things I learned from your, your movie and I want to just post them. And uh, if you care to jump in and comment on these factoids, that'd be fun. Um, here's my first thing that I learned. Every five or 10 years or so, I must oil my leather-bound books. <laughs> and you should go see Oral at, at B.B. Muhammad's shop. He's like one of the best in the business, I think, at caring for leather-bound books. And they're beautiful. I don't happen to have any, unfortunately. Um, Mao Zedong, who ordered mass book burnings, was a librarian in his earlier life, or in his early life. Just true fact that everybody knows. It's quite, quite stunning yeah. to know that. So, um, sorry, go ahead. A little disheartening. Exactly. How people change. Um, another interesting fact that I learned, like well, I kind of had to look this up because I didn't know this, but a codex is features in, in a very interesting scene in the movie. And that I learned is the next step in publishing after the handwritten scroll. It's a bound volume of um, parchment, written handwritten in manuscripts, handwritten on both sides of the parchment and often richly illustrated and very expensive. And um, that all, that research that I did all came from learning from the film that the highest ever price paid for a book at auction was 28 million for Da Vinci's Codex, bought by da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, Bill Gates in 1994. That was quite a scene. Very interesting. Um, do you think he's reading it as we speak? Or <laughs> um, okay, just another reminder for questions, Q and A, which we'll get to very soon. Um, just go to the little Q&A box down at the bottom and uh, send us your questions. What's next for you all? That's a good question. Um, let's see. Well, we have a little small project around the election in New York that we're um, kind of throwing together here. Um, we'll see how that's a little, little open-ended right now, but have some ideas for us. So um, it's a idea we had to engage the moment in our own way a little bit um and not directly politically so much as just kind mm -hmm. of about the 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 mindset of new york in this moment um in general a little bit um not to go into it too much and then 
we all have a, a Shakespeare related project we've done some work on in the past that we has been on hold a little with um, COVID, but after COVID, I think we can um, hopefully get back into. Um, so those are two things. You've got mm -hmm. some. Good luck with those. And, and Dan, do you have a brick and mortar bookstore? No, I, so I did for those years in the late 90s, early into 2000s. Mm -hmm. But uh, so like many rare booksellers, I keep an, an office of, by appointment. So a number of the, the booksellers in the film, David Bergman, work out of homes. Or, or offices. Adam Weinberger has an office in one place in New York. Um, so my, my office is not too far from, from Jim Cummins. I don't quite have the size of staff that he does, but uh, it's no longer the kind of street level brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. like to at one point, um, if someone out there listening today is interested in opening a big bookshop out in the country somewhere, uh, I have a lot of books for you. We have a bookstore in Chatham, New York for sale. Oh. Lovely, wonderful little shop. Come and see it. <laughs> I need the bookshops that have the bookshelves empty. Oh. I'm not, not the ones that are full already. What I need to do I is, know. is All move right. my warehouse into one of those empty shelved already uh, locations. It's, well, we hope the best for these small shops that are finding that they have to end things. Um, and we don't know this full story on our local bookstore, but it's been through several hands and we'll see what's next for them too. We do have some Q and A's and we can look at those. Um, David, congratulations on the film and thank you for joining our book festival. I love the movie and wanted to learn more about the world the book world, more about some collectors and booksellers, more about specific books, et cetera. Have you thought of a part two or continuing this journey in other places outside New York or the country, London, Istanbul? I think I, I always thought of this just as a, as a self-contained film. Um, and the New York focus was really, I think, to, as we talked earlier about finding a way to to keep it contained because you just, as you, you know, it could keep, we could keep going forever if we started introducing all the different cities of the world and the dealers. Um, so I don't know that I feel like, like I have a vision for going further with it without replicating sort of more of the same in a way that for me personally, I wouldn't necessarily be inclined to do. But that said, if someone else um, has a vision for wanting to do more of the same elsewhere, you know, I'd more power to them. I mean, certainly all the cities listed, I'm sure, you know, all the major cities in the world have fascinating book stories that could be told and wonderful, you know, book dealers that you could talk to. Right. Another question is, oh, I can answer this one from Nancy. How can we watch the movie at home? Easy. Just go to booksellersmovie.com and they'll give you lots of choices. Booksellersmovie.com and get uh, links to any of the, um, what what did you say, iTunes? And I, definitely Amazon. Yep. Netflix had it, I don't know if they still do. Netflix has the, the DVD. Um, as oh, a, that um, you uh, purchased. Uh -huh. Yeah, or, or rent, I think. Um, yeah, and Vim, Vimeo, Google Play, it's on all the, the major digital platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, if for some reason there's someone listening that's not based in the US, um, there's another website, booksellersdocumentary.com that lists international. Uh, options. Okay, booksellersmovie.com. Um, and a question from Louis. Louise, I'm sorry. Um, you must have some leather books, Louise. She asks, what type of oil? Oh. <laughs> you know, Damn. I hate, Dan may know, he told, we actually had an, a much more extensive like breakdown of the whole process that BB and Oral showed us but we had to condense it in the end, but it's been too long for me to remember all the details of the oils and the, and the polishes, but Dan, you might know. There's a company, Talus, in New York um, that has a lot of like the perfect non-acidic glues, all archival um, products that you can use for all sorts of things, including um, an, an oil dressing, um, probably several different uh, brands for, for books. Um, and then there are places like Imperial Fine Books um, that will, you know, for, for a small fee, do it, do it for you, um, or even walk you through the process to help you the next time. 
I highly recommend the movie to anybody who hasn't seen it yet. Uh, it's just wonderful. You will not regret tuning into it. I would like to offer a huge thank you to our panelists. It was great fun and very informative too. If you haven't seen the movie, find out to watch how to watch it at booksellersmovie.com once again, never too often. Stay tuned to uh, SpencerTownAcademy.org for information on other author sessions. Up upcoming tomorrow is an interview with Joyce Carol Oates on her new novel, Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars. And next Wednesday, Robert Kolker joins us to discuss Hidden Valley Road, his look into a large American family burdened by diagnoses of schizophrenia in six of its 12 children. And don't forget to check out our online special book sale. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Bye for now. Thanks, Thank you Jill. so much. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.